<laughs> but uh, I did call out. I did say she will be getting baptized later. So we are going to have a baptism after service today. Here's how that's going to work. I, ha I do have a message. And after that message, we will take a short break. And then we don't even really have to go anywhere because you can stay right here. We will draw the curtains and the baptismal is right behind the stage. We're so proud of the new setup that we have. I want to thank the men, Frank and, and Paul, for getting that all set up. And we're going to have it right afterwards. So don't leave. This is a great time to celebrate those that are being baptized. So um, last Sunday was a powerful time. There's no doubt. I really believe that something happened in this church last Sunday uh, in a good way, in a spiritual sense. I believe there were some things that broke, that there, there were some breakthroughs that happened. I believe that some strongholds are beginning to be broken. And we had, at the end of the service, we had an altar call that was unlike anything I've experienced since I became pastor here. We had men lined up in a circle that quickly turned into an oblong oval because there was not enough room for a circle. There were so many men up here talking and sharing and praying for each other. And likewise, the same was being done over here with the ladies. And it went a long time. <laughs> We did not live stream that. We stopped live streaming. We always want to provide, um, uh, what am I trying to say, privacy for those that are coming up. So even, even down the road when we stop live streaming in March, we're going to be recording the messages. I just want you to know the altar calls are not recorded. I want to make sure people have privacy. So, uh, so that happened, and it was such a great time of sharing. It felt like it was a watershed moment. It really did. I was so proud of this church, and some things were shared. I know, at least on the men's side, men don't share like that normally. <laughs> we needed a, 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 a forum. We need a, a safe environment like that for us men to share what we're struggling with and pray for each other. So I'm going to ask my brother Jim to come up and make an extremely important announcement. So come on up, Jim. Well, good morning, church. Um, before I make the announcement, can I just say this? Are we seeing revival? Are you seeing what's going on? Are you seeing what's happening in universities? The Asbury, Lee, can you feel it? I know God's pouring out his spirit in these last days. And we need to be in it, and we need to stay in it. Um, you know, it's funny, back in my old racing days, uh, we used to line up on the line, Jerry, you can relate to this, flag would go down, and basically, whoever had the courage and the guts to stay on the throttle to that first turn typically would win the race, and that's where we're going to have to be. The throttle's down, and I think we're going to have to stay on it, guys. There's no letting back. I mean, I honestly believe we are in the last days. There's no doubt about it. So um, it, what happened last week was beautiful. And, and so uh, what we want to do starting next week, and it's going to be every other week, is um, at 9 o'clock Sunday, this, this will be starting next Sunday, and then every other Sunday after that, we want whatever, whoever wants to come at 9 o'clock in the morning, and this goes for both men and women. Men, we're going to meet downstairs at 9, and the women are going to meet up here at 9. We're just going to have coffee. There's no big agenda or anything. Let's just, you know, a little fellowship prior, like a, like a pregame warm-up before our quarterback takes the stage up here. Um, but it's going to give us a chance to kind of get to know each other. You know, it's usually just a, hey, how you doing up here, and then everybody leaves. Um, but let's, uh, let's just maybe try to get together a little early and hang out and, you know, and have some coffee and, and uh, talk a little bit before we come up here. So starting next Sunday at 9 o'clock, going to have to get up an hour earlier. And, uh, and even, if you'd, even if you straggle in after that, guys, just, we're, just, we're trying to, this is a family, and we want to keep that. And we, we need to keep things going because, like I said, I think it's going to really accelerate here. Uh, you watch what God's going to do. There's no doubt about it. He's doing it, and uh, you're either on board or you're not. And I think we're at that point now. So um, anyway, so next Saturday, 9 o'clock. I'm sorry, Sunday, 
Sunday. Keep thinking Saturdays. Sunday. Do it Saturday, too, if you want. Hey Amen. I'm so excited about that. We, we want to continue in that vein of what happened uh, here Sunday, uh, last Sunday. And again, we're going to go in. The men are going to go in the room downstairs. We have a little bit of privacy. And, you know, he said share, but, you know, honestly, it's not about getting together and talking about the, the weather or the government, <laughs> as we like to do. But it's really kind of sharing like we did, you know. Hey, what, where can guys come together and say, man, I've been struggling, you know. Where I'm, I, I don't know. I, I have a hard time believing this whole thing for, for me, you know, or whatever it is. And then we're going to pray for each other. So that is, that's awesome. I'm so thankful for that. So uh, I like your analogy, brother. Let's keep the thr- throttle. Let's keep it throttled, man. Let's keep, it, uh, keep that gas on, right? Um, all right. So did I get everything? Did I miss anything? <laughs> Uh, we still have a lot to do. Not a lot, but we um, we are going to. I have a short message. I think it'll be shorter than usual, and uh, we're going to have the baptismal. Then anybody that leads in this church, anybody that is going to be serving or is currently serving, we're going to stay downstairs and have a lunch, and we're going to talk about this whole idea of part of our vision of being a safe place where people can heal and not hide. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to do that quarterly. So that's good. We want to make sure everybody's on the right page, same page. Let's repeat, please, after, uh, repeat after me or repeat with me. I open my heart to receive from the word of God. God's promises are true, and they are true for me. So praise God. Last week, we said, we made a statement that said, there is nothing as effective in healing as forgiveness. There are a lot of things that are healing. Love is healing. Kindness is healing, but forgiveness is, there is nothing as healing as forgiveness. And we learn that God himself sets the standard for forgiveness. Amen? That's what he does anyway. He he commands something of us, and then he sets the standard. He he, he makes the, he, he does the first pass at it so we can see what it looks like. And he surely sets a standard on forgiveness. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 103. I will only read five verses of it today. It says, praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Okay, what are some of those benefits? Well, here's a few. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. That's a great benefit, amen. (laughs) Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Praise God for that. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I said so much on that last week. I'm tempted to re-preach that, but I want to move on. Um, as we looked at the healing aspects of forgiveness, we noted a couple of them, and or a few of them, and just a couple of them are the idea that forgiveness releases the other person, if you could show that. Forgiveness releases the other person. It's not a matter, it's not a, you're not saying it's okay and we're not patting them on the back. We're not, there's no denial here, but it releases the other person. And aren't you glad that when God forgives us, he releases us? The Bible says as far away as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. He releases them from us. That means he doesn't hold us, hold them against us anymore. Praise God. Psalm 32 says that. Blessed is the one who, who, who sins the Lord does not hold against them. And, um, and but we also talked about this idea that forgiveness heals by bringing much needed relief. Boy, isn't that true? And when you think about it, isn't healing about relief? Think about the idea of healing. Isn't it about relief? I want to be healed of this disease. Well, I want to be relieved of it. I want to be healed of this pain. I want to be relieved of it. Well, when God forgives us, guess what? There's much needed relief. Amen. That load is lifted off, right? Indeed, blessed is the one whose sins are forgiven. In other words, I just had a load lifted off that I wasn't meant to carry, right? So forgiveness does this. I'm so glad for it. And the most important forgiveness is is indeed extended from God to us. So I just want to ask you a question. Have you accepted God's forgiveness? Have you accepted God's forgiveness? I mean, that's a good question. See, this forgiveness is simply obtained when we accept Jesus' finished work on the cross. By his death on the cross, all of our sins are canceled, paid in full. It's a free gift for those who believe in him as their Savior and Lord. 
We don't, we, 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 sometimes we make it more complicated than that. Well, I'm forgiven if I just stop everything that I was doing wrong and I live a perfect life. No, it doesn't say anything in there about that. It's a, it is simply a matter of accepting Jesus' finished work on the cross. It's a matter of what he did, and then our job is to believe and receive it. Amen? So look what it says in John 1, one of my favorite sections of Scripture. I preach from this often. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, so there's the believing and receiving, right? Receiving is like a gift. You receive a gift. You just accept it, right? And then the believing is when you're choosing to believe it over what the lies of the enemy says, right? I believe. I believe that he is he is who he says he is. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe there are three in one. Amen? The Apostles' Creed. These are all statements of belief. See, that's what we're saying. I'm choosing to believe that Jesus is now Lord of my life. That not only was I saved then, but I'm, day, I'm being saved, and I'm going to be saved when I see him in heaven. This this week, anybody use the Abide app besides me and my wife? Anybody ever heard of that app, the Abide app? It is a great app if you haven't checked it out. It's a great Bible study. It's a meditation app. She's turned me on to it. I, like, I love it. This last week, they were doing a seven-day uh, step to victory, and they were, they were rallying around the armor of God. And I love the day, of, the, the day uh, of, that it was a helmet of salvation. The uh, narrator used this analogy. This talked about a mama bear. Anybody that's ever been in the mountains or, or hunted, you always hear about, if you see a mother mama bear with her cubs, don't even re- think about messing with them because that mama bear will protect those cubs with everything. She will do whatever it takes to protect those cubs. And we understand that. We have fear of that. That's pretty significant. How much more will Jesus, our protector, Jesus, our protector, the author and perfecter of our faith. How much more will he fight for us? Amen. Have you ever experienced him fighting for you? My wife and I have. And that's exactly what we get when we believe and receive in his name because he gave us the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. That is what forgiven means. So in other words, it's saying Forgiveness is not of natural descent. It is born of God. Okay, what does natural descent mean? That means origin. It is not something that was originated with us. That's what that means. It is not something that it originated with God. God first to us. Amen? The temple, the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. From top to bottom, not from bottom to top. See, if it was bottom to top, then that, was, that means I did it, and you know, maybe God didn't want it. I don't know. We kind of forced the issue or something. No, he did it. He invited us into his presence, and the Bible says we can now come into the Holy of Holies with boldness and confidence. Amen? Jesus did that for us. So forgiveness is not something that we dreamed up. It was born of God. And so when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. By the way, that's in John 19, if you're making notes. No matter when he said those words, that means that from now on, no matter what you've done, the grace of God is always sufficient. His forgiveness is always complete. Amen? Always complete. There's an old saying that if God wasn't willing to forgive sin, heaven would be empty. (laughs) Anybody ever heard that? That's an old one. It's been around for a long time. If God wasn't willing to forgive sin, heaven would be empty. And 2 Peter put it this way in chapter 3. He says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to what? Repentance. See that? That's God's heart, guys. That's his kind of forgiveness. He, in other words, he's saying, God... Now, God gave us all free will. Now, this is, a, this is a hard one to understand. I'm not, I don't want to blow anybody's circuit, but he gave us all the free will and the ability to choose or not choose. That's why we're told in the Bible, choose you this day whom you will choose. Whereas for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's a choice. He gave us that choice, but at the same time, he's also omniscient. He's also omnipresent. He's in the future and the past and the present all at the same time. 
He already knows who's going to do it and who's not going to do it, but he gives us a free choice. I can't figure that out, man. I start vapor locking when I try to get my mind around that. All I know is I serve a sovereign God who's able to be with me in the present, go with me in the future. He gives me a choice. He knows who's going to choose him and who's not. And then he tells us in John 15, by the way, even that choice that you thought you did, you didn't choose me. I chose you. (laughs) And we are predestined. Every one of us were counted and accounted for and chosen before the foundation of the earth, before the literally the earth was laid. He knew that you would be here today. Praise God declaring your faith in him, going against the grain of society, going against the grain of culture, going against the grain of the academia, even the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the talking heads and all the intelligence of the world. You're going against that grain. The Bible calls us an awkward and peculiar race because we're going against the grain as it were. And God knew from the beginning that you would be chosen and be part of that minority. The Bible says the way is wide and heavily traveled and and many will go down that road that leads to destruction. But narrow is the way and narrow is the gate for those that will choose to go his way. I'm so glad that I chose that years ago. I'm so glad that I had a a wide gate I could have gone down when my life fell apart. I could have climbed back in that bottle and like so many people did and just gone that way. But I said, no, this is my life on the hook. I will choose your way, Father, all my life I've known of you. If you're really real now, I need you now more than ever. And he says, welcome in to the fold, my son. Welcome in. I, I, I knew that you were going to choose me. You are mine. And by the way, even that nudging, I put that in you. See, he does it all. He does all the heavy lifting. We can't take credit for any of it. Amen. It is his Indeed, it is born of him. It is not of natural descent. It is not of our own choosing. See, if it's our own choosing, that means I can choose one day and not choose the next day. Like, I'm on the team, off the team. Anybody ever feel like that? On the team, off the team. On the team, off the team. No, no, no. He chose us. And he is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. In other words, he's always at work. He's got a plan. You just got to learn how to trust him. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Okay, what does that mean? Repentance. That's a churchy word. That means it's not not just saying, I'm sorry. You know, saying, you know, apology is saying, hey, I I stole that cookie. You caught me. I'm sorry. Repentance is saying, I'm not even going to go close to that jar because I don't trust myself to not steal another cookie. (laughs) See? Repentance is changing your direction, right? It's not only saying, God, this was wrong, but it's now saying, God, I'm going to go the other way. (laughs) And that's what repentance is all about. That is what God's calling his church to right now. He says, if my people will humble themselves and pray. But he says before that, he says, who are called by my name. See, remember I said he called you. That's when we're going to see revival, not when the government comes around. I heard Greg Laurie talk about that today. I said, amen, I believe every word of that. I'm completely on board. God is indeed about to bring revival of this nation, man. I, there is so many stirrings. Like Jim said, those revivals that we're hearing about in those colleges, are you kidding me? Why not start with the young people? Of course, of course it needs to start with the young people. We're hearing about it. There's a movie coming out, Jesus Revolution. Man, we're trying to get a group. We're trying to figure out how we can get a group there to see that movie. I can't wait for that. You see the previews yet? It's awesome, man. I started, I teared up when I saw the previews of that. Chuck Smith, the old origin of the Vineyard Movement, you know, which is where Maranatha music came out of and all of that. And then it went on and Greg Laurie uh, got saved in that ministry and started his Harvest Crusade. Tens of thousands of people have come to Christ through that. I believe God can do the whole thing all over again. You think he is limited to the 60s? He's about to do something new in our generation. He's getting his church aligned for it. And that's why, Jim, I believe it. Uh, I agree with our brother Jim that said revival is happening, guys, with, it, with or without us. So that's God's heart. That's his forgiveness. But if we're honest, if we're honest, sometimes we have a hard time accepting that free gift of grace, don't we? I mean, can we really take it to be that simple? Perhaps we don't trust ourselves with a free gift like that, especially if we don't feel qualified for his forgiveness. Amen? You know what I'm talking about? Let's face it, at times, 
Our own sensibilities won't let us accept God's free gift of grace and forgiveness as it is. So we try to come at him in our own terms when we're feeling more spiritual. You know what I'm talking about? When we're perhaps feeling more worthy. I mean, we all do this to a certain degree. I feel more acceptable when dot, dot, dot. When what? When I got my act together. When I'm in the word. When I'm doing this. I feel more lovable. You could just fill in the, uh, the adjective there. Right? And we addressed this last week, guys. I want to just hit this head on. And I feel the spirit of the Lord unctioning me here to just hit this. We need to repent of the pride that says we know more about our condition than God does. That's pride. I mean, how can that be pride? Pastor, I wallow in shame. Yeah, pride is confidence in the flesh in any way. It's saying, I know more about me than you do, Lord. You say I'm qualified. I say I'm disqualified. You say I'm loved. I say I'm unlovable. That's pride. Call it what it is. It's confidence in the flesh. But today I want to talk about yet another side of forgiveness in the time that I have remaining, the side that is just as hard, if not harder, than accepting God's forgiveness, and that is literally forgiving ourselves. Can we go there? Will you let me go there? So I want to ask now another question. Have you forgiven yourself? Why would I be preaching about this? Because, guys, because frankly, I've heard too many Christians, too many people in this church say, I have a hard time forgiving myself. So this is real, so let's get into it. Let's hit it real quick today. Perhaps you can forgive others and maybe even grow to a point where you can accept God's forgiveness. Okay, that's good. You need to get to that point. But at the same time, perhaps you feel the guilt and shame of your past is just too much to forgive, and so you hold it against yourself. Guys, here's the, here's the problem with that. In that state, you can read the promises in the Bible, and they just bounce off. They don't stick because they don't, you don't feel like it applies to you. It doesn't resonate like it should, such as one of the most famous ones in, in Isaiah 118. He says, come, let us, I memorized the version that says, come, let us reason together. It says here, come, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And here's the problem, guys. When we cannot forgive ourselves, please listen to me. I only, uh, give me 10 minutes here. When we cannot forgive ourselves, verses like this just sound like church church speak. Just like that, that I started out the service with. I quoted from Philippians. God has exalted Jesus, given him a name that is above every name. You can just hear pastors talk like that. Maybe we'll get a, a little thing going with our jaws. You know, God has exalted Jesus. Okay, what does that mean? You know, that's church speak. I'm not interested in that. You don't talk about churchy talk, but doesn't really have a practical meaning where we live and breathe. Guys, we need to wake up and realize these, this is God saying this. this is God's, these are God's words. God is speaking. And what he's basically saying is, hey, can we just talk? <laughs> he knows anyway. Can we just talk? Come, let us reason together means come. Just stop waiting till you get your act together and get your eyes dotted. Just come as you are. Amen? Let us reason together. I know anyway. And then he says, Though your sins, in other words, your mistakes, your brokenness, though they are like scarlet, though they are as red as crimson, what does that mean? Well, these are permanent stains. Back in the Hebrew, especially the, the time of, the, of, of the, this was written in Hebrew, back in those times, in that culture, there were stains like purple and even some reds and dark reds. Those were considered permanent stains. If you stain something scarlet or crimson or purple, that was it. There was no restaining it. That was it. And that's, what, that's why it says this. In other words, God is talking about the permanent stains, the indelible things. Okay, what does indelible mean? Well, indelible means not able to be forgotten or removed. Hello. We write on something in indelible ink. That means you can't remove it, right? Guys, that's a premise for this whole season of healing series that God not only wants to remove the sin and brokenness in our lives, but he wants to remove the indelible stain they left. How many know that our sins 
and our mistakes and our choices and the choices that have been made against us, the hurts, the traumas, all of this, they leave stains on us, don't they? Indelible at times. And we think, surely this is just how we are. God wants to, us to know that he can remove even those. Amen. I'm talking about those things, guys, that we can't let ourselves forget. Those things that we can't seem to remove. Well, that's a problem. You were never meant to remove them. Hello. You were never meant to remove them. Only he can do that. So we say, we cry out, God, remove this indelible stain on my sin and brokenness. Remove it to the point where it's forgotten. Amen. Those are good things to, to, uh, to call out to the Lord in. What does this mean? That means, God, do this to where these things are no longer in play in my life, where they no longer have sway in my life. But the truth is, guys, and listen, I'm going to get practical here for the next few minutes. Do you love me? I don't know. You may not in a few minutes. <laughs> but that's all right, because what I'm about to preach, I really believe, is from the Holy Spirit. There's going to be a few ouch moments, but it's good. We need an ouch moment now and then. See, again, we want these things to be removed where they no longer have a play in our life. They don't, no longer have sway in our lives. But the truth is, we leave them in play when we refuse to forgive ourselves. Hello. We leave them. We leave them in play. We do. We need these areas of brokenness that we allow to stay in our hearts. We are allowing these things to stay in play in our lives. We do that. We do that. Guys, that's not God's kind of healing. So I just want to say that when we refuse to forgive ourselves, we are holding ourselves to a higher standard than God himself does. We're playing God, and that's pride. Wow. That's why I said you're not going to like me here. You ever heard that? Ever, ever heard it put that way? It's pride if we refuse to forgive ourselves. We're literally holding ourselves to a higher standard than God does. We're saying, okay, God, I know you're all that, but, you know, I just, I don't know. I just... I feel like if I let myself off the hook, I'd just get, I don't know. You're, you're, you're not getting the whole thing. He wants to remove it as far away as the east is from the west. That means they never meet. And we're coming at him with a different doctrine. We're saying, I know more than you do about my own condition. I can't be forgiven for that. I got to hold that. I, I just can't get it out of my mind. Well, guys, you're doing that. <laughs> We're doing that. I do that. When we do that, you can blame the devil all you want. But we hold on because we're refusing to accept God's full grace by forgiving ourselves. That's pride. Okay. Here's another ouch moment. Let's address victim mentality. That's, believe it or not, that's similar. Believe it or not, it's similar. Because, you know, victim mentality, you kind of think of it as maybe that's the opposite of refusing to forgive ourselves. But guess what? That's pride. Because you're choosing to stay in that instead of what God says for you. God wants to free you of that. He says, no, you're a victor, not a victim. And you're saying, no, I'm a victim. Look at what all these people have done to me. That's why I'm this way. See, I, I'm done with that. How about you? We need to move forward, and we're never going to move forward if we're still living in the past. We carry these bricks around from our past. All you're going to do is rebuild the same house over and over. I said that last week. Victim mentality is pride. Sorry. I know that hurts. It, I know it's hard. That's, hard. that's a hard thing to say because people that struggle with victim mentality have indeed, be, have indeed been traumatized and have indeed been hurt. But see, the problem is, is that you start seeing life through that filter. Victim mentality is a mindset that becomes a, 
uh, something that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We're going to talk about that in a couple weeks when I talk about strongholds. All right? You get what I'm saying? It's pride. Can I just call it that? You're saying, no, God, I know. I know what you say, but I know. I know. I can't. If I just stick my neck out, boy, my head's going to be chopped off. You know, that's just the way it always is for me, Lord. Everybody's out to get me, you know, all this, whatever it is. That is not what God says about you. The Bible says we are supposed to take captive these things. The weapons we have, to have divine power to tear down and demolish these strongholds. Somebody needs to stand up and say, in the name of Jesus, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm not going there anymore. So, I want you to know. I wrote that down in my notes. Okay? Refusing to forgive ourselves and victim mentality or pride. Get this. I believe the Holy Spirit said they're both lazy too. Okay? I told you I was going to be giving some ouch moments here. Lazy. Lazy. It's lazy to wallow in victim mentality. It doesn't require any work. It doesn't require, it doesn't require the work involved in forgiving ourselves and doing the hard lifting that, that says, I believe God, and I'm going to go against every grain, every neuron that's firing in my mind right now about my past. In Jesus' name, I'm standing against that, and I'm going to tear down that stronghold in the name of Jesus. That's some heavy lifting. It is... Victim mentality is lazy. It's lazy. It doesn't require work, right? Well, I try. I try. Always everything comes back on me. It's lazy. At first, when I wrote that down, I went, oh, I don't even know if I'm going to say that or not. People are going to probably stone me or something. I did. I wrote it right here. It's in my blue ink because I wrote it as a separate note later on. Lazy. But but after I unpacked it, after the Holy Spirit started unpacking in my mind, I go, well, yeah, that's true. It doesn't require any work. There's no work required in being victim mentality and just hanging around and licking your wounds. Curse, nurse, and rehearse, right? That doesn't require any effort at all. I can just build my little fortress around me, right? Protect myself. And all of it is contrary and counter to what God is calling his church to. Did you know the Bible says that the, the kingdom of God suffers Violence, but it says the violent take it by force. See, it is warfare, guys. It is warfare, and as a man of God, I want you to know that resonates with me. That is a, it is not a matter of authority or like some kind of hierarchy over my wife or my kids. What that means is that it's a positional thing. That means my role is that if the enemy is going to try, to try to come in and mess with my family, guess what? He's got to come through me. You think I'm going to be able to fight that with victim mentality and all this stuff about refusing to forgive myself? Are you kidding me? Can't happen. It's not just about men, too, guys. He's calling us all. He's calling us all to pull ourselves out of that. Amen? Guys, God is our master. He's our church. I mean, he's our creator. He's our master builder. He knows what is below the surface. He knows what keeps surfacing and causing us to struggle. And he wants to do a miraculous deep cleaning, amen, and a permanent uprooting of what has been deep-rooted in us, a healing that only he can do, and it will indeed be miraculous. Somebody say amen. But here's the problem. We delay the healing process when we refuse to forgive ourselves. Hello. And literally, we're hitting the pause button. On the other hand, the good news is we accelerate. The opposite is true, too. We accelerate the process when we cooperate through belief and obedience. You literally accelerate it. In fact, I would go so far as to say that our obedience serves as an accelerant in God's miracle. (laughs) Anybody that studied chemical uh, chemistry knows what an accelerant means. It's it's something that's added. It's like a catalyst that's added to, to to a combination of uh, of, of chemicals that, that accelerates the, the, uh, the interaction. It's an accelerant. It causes it to happen overnight. You know, I think about, I've poured my share of concrete in the day, in my day, and sometimes when you're pouring in the dead of winter, you want to put that accelerant in, right, that helps it to dry quick, right? I did it, by the way, I poured concrete one time in mid-December, 
in foggy, cold conditions, and I did not use the accelerant, and I was out there at 11 o'clock at night screeding. With a fan on, I went to my shop and got a big old fan. Remember that? Outside my backyard. I'm out there at 11 o'clock like a fool screeding because I did not use accelerant. See? We, our belief in obedience is an accelerant to what God wants to do in our lives. We can literally speed the healing process by coming to God with complete surrender like we sing about perfect song selection today. Complete surrender and abandonment to what he wants to do in our lives, laying down our own agendas, surrendering whatever needs to be surrendered, habits, attitudes, doubts, fears, worries, and even, yes, correcting what we think and say and coming clean about our habit of playing God and not forgiving ourselves. God has made it clear that what he wants to do with our darkness from our past. Let me read a different version of what I read out of Isaiah. This is the Living Bible version. It says, come, let's talk this over, says the Lord. No matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can take it out and make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. Even if you are stained as red as crimson, I can make you white as wool if you will only let me help you. Get that. If you will only. That means we have a choice. Can you imagine? Can you hear the Lord beckoning right now? If you will only let me help you but you stay in this stuff. You keep on wanting to live in the past. You keep on wanting to hold on to this, whatever it is. But if you will only help me, what does that mean? Cooperate. Just submit, man. Surrender. That's all he's asking you to do. He's not asking you to do a calculus problem. <laughs> he's not asking you to do a miracle, you know, be a saint and do two miracles, you know. And we'll, uh, we'll, you know, we'll, 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 we'll uh, put a, a saint thing on. No, he's not asking for any of that. Belief and obedience. Cooperate, right? Even if you're stained as red as, as red as crimson, I can make you white as snow or white as wool. If you will only let me help you, get this, if you will only obey, there's that obedience thing, then I will make you rich. I love it. Make you rich. Woo. Where's the money, man? Right? No, no, no. It's that way. I, there are, there are things a lot more rich than, than a wad of cash. How about just peace with yourself? How about just peace with God? How about a future of power, a destiny, a victory? Then you can say, indeed, as the song says, I'm going to see a victory because I am fully confident. And I can say, like David said in my favorite psalm, one of my favorite psalms, I was reading it this morning. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In other words, in my situation. You see, I'm not going to remain confident if my mind's all over the place. Can't forgive myself. I'm wallowing in shame, living in the past, victim mentality, all that stuff. Are you kidding? There's no confidence in that. Right? Is there any confidence in that? Not at all, man. We're just like a, it's like Satan's got a ping pong paddle, and we're just the ball, just two, 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 right? Circumstances, we're batted all over the place, right? The Bible says that we're supposed to be more than conquerors. No matter how dark, no matter how unloved, no matter how worthless you feel, God loves you. It's just a fact. Amen? Your feelings about yourself do not change his love for you one bit. So if God himself can forgive you, how can you withhold forgiveness from yourself? And I tell you what, if I was preaching this at a uh, support group or a, a group of, uh, of recovering people, you know, so many times we have a hard time forgiving ourselves. We've made a lot of mistakes. Sometimes we have made bad mistakes in the past that we can't, they just get our, their hooks in us. And he's saying, I don't hold that against you. You shouldn't either. It's holding you back, in fact, in fact. I believe that we must forgive ourselves before we can honestly be able to forgive others. How about that? The answer, how can I say that? Real quickly, I'm just about done. The answer is found in Matthew 22, where Jesus was asked, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love your neighbor, or love your, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and all the prophets hang on these two commands, commandments. 
In other words, it all, it all comes down to this. That's what he's saying. All of it. All 66 books. It all comes down to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, well, that's the problem. See, I hate myself. Okay, we got a problem. Then you can't love your, your neighbor. Well, I don't forgive myself. Well, then you can't forgive your neighbor because you're giving away something you don't have. <laughs> you're giving from a deficit. You know, we know our government, man. Our government gets good at deficit spending, man. We, we deficit spend all the time. We give away what we don't have. Well, I don't believe it for me, but I want it for you, you know. Well, I just want the best for you. Baloney. You're giving out of a deficit. It's fake. It's, it's, it's shallow, and it's going to burn you out. You're giving what you don't have, right? And that's what Jesus is saying. Hey, he also said the words, by the way, freely you have received, now freely give. The problem is many of us haven't received. <laughs> and we're trying to give what we haven't received. So enough of that deficit spending, amen? <laughs> so let's go ahead and address a popular misconception also before I quit about forgiving ourselves. And that myth is this idea that forgiving ourselves means ignoring or denying our past. This is not about denial. This is not about us getting by with something. Sometimes our sensibility won't let us do it. Like, I can't be trusted with that. This isn't about being let off the hook, as they say. It is simply about acknowledging God's grace by showing ourselves some grace. Hello. It's about aligning our thoughts with his. It's about agreeing with what he says about us. You get what I'm saying? It's an acknowledgement of what God has done in forgiving us and then choosing to accept it and do the same. So I'll leave you with this thought. When we forgive ourselves, we are doing it out of reverence for God's grace. You get what I'm saying? We're doing it out of reverence for God's grace. Well, if that's true, then maybe the opposite is true. If we can't forgive ourselves, then maybe we're not really fully appreciating what God has done and fully understanding what God has done. Okay? So if we're living in victim mentality, if we're wallowing in the past, if we can't forgive ourselves, then we need to repent for that. Say, God, okay, that clearly means I don't have a good grasp on what you've done for me. I'm seeing myself completely differently than you do. I'm not walking in victory. I'm not walking in power. I'm not being led by the Spirit. Do you think the Spirit would lead anybody in, in a path that means victim mentality? I want, to be walk, I want to walk in the Spirit. I want to be led by the Spirit. Oh, no, it doesn't work. You're not being led by the Spirit. You're not walking in the Spirit if you're wallowing in that stuff. So he wants us, he does want us to walk, walk in the Spirit, amen? He wants us to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what that dunamis power is all about. He told his disciples, stay here in Jerusalem until I send the comforter. And he says to them, what? Okay, what? Why are we staying here? Because you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And then you'll be my witnesses. See? In other words, you don't go on your own power. You go on your own power, you're going to be holding all your, you're going to be carrying all your junk. You're doing, going, doing the power of the Holy Spirit. See, that's what it's all about, guys, power. Walking in power, having the power to walk and live as a Christian man and the Christian woman that we're called to be, having the power of the Holy Spirit behind us to walk in victory and be ready when God brings that revival and says, I am calling my church to attention. Are we going to be ready when God fills this church? Are we really going to be ready or are we still licking our wounds and all this other stuff because it'll be fake and it'll be shallow? God wants his church healthy and whole, amen? Healthy and whole and ready for that harvest that he wants to bring. Do you agree with me? I want to be a part of that generation. Let's please stand with me. I want to close in prayer. This is, a, this is something between you and the Lord. I'm going to address both categories of what I preached about today. The idea that maybe, just maybe we're having a hard time accepting God's forgiveness and maybe, just maybe, we're having a hard time forgiving ourselves or we're still living in the past with victim mentality or whatever. I'm going to address those. And if that's you, I want you, to, I want you to pray with me these words because we're going to repent for that, okay? We're going to, we know the Bible says 
He who conceals his sins does not prosper, but he who confesses them and what? Renounces them, finds mercy. Renounces means I'm drawing a line in the sand. I'm not going that direction anymore, Lord. I was going this way. Now I'm going that way. I'm breaking ties, as it were. That's what that means. So pray with me. Father, in Jesus' name, we, we love your word, Lord. We, your words are eternal life, God. Your words have eternal life, Lord. We don't have answers in this world, God. It's only you. You made us, and you know exactly how we tick. You know exactly what makes us work and what, we, what makes us not work, Lord. And, Father, many of us have bought a lie that, that is said that we have all of these other attachments, and we are free in you, but we have all these other attachments like, like these post-its all over us, these labels all over us, Lord. And we are like we are trying to run a race with his leg weights on, whereas you want to free us. And I believe somebody's going to be free right now in the name of Jesus. I believe something's going to fall off right now, Lord, as we call these things out, Lord. I pray that your fire from heaven would come right now, God, and just burn these things off of us, Lord God. I just think of the Hebrew boys. They went into that furnace, Lord, and then the only thing that burned them were the ropes that bound them. In the name of Jesus, I pray the same for us, God, as we hold these things up to you. As we lift these things up to you, Lord, we want to confess now or in Jesus' name and renounce this spirit, this lie that is said that we are not worthy and that we have not fully received your forgiveness. I just stand against that lie right now in the name of Jesus. We repent for it, Father, and we renounce that lie in the name of Jesus. Satan, you're a liar. God, let your glory come right now, Father, and wash us whiter than snow, just like we sing that that old song. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but you washed it white as snow. Let it fall right now, God. Let your spirit fall on this place. And every home, God, that is watching right now, God, wash us clean, Lord. We accept your forgiveness. We receive your grace, Father. Jesus' name, hallelujah. And likewise, Lord, we lift up, God, these pretensions, these these. Uh, accusations, these arguments, this knowledge that exalts itself against your knowledge, Lord, this victim mentality, Lord. It's lazy. It's got to go. God, refusing to forgive ourselves, holding ourselves to a different standard than you do. It's lazy. It's got to go. God, it's in the way. We repent for that, Father, in Jesus' name. And we renounce that lie. Satan, you are a liar. In the name of Jesus, we declare victory. Starting today, whole new day, whole new day of freedom, whole new day of victory, whole new day, Father, of walking in the freedom and the, and the righteousness that you have purchased for us with the sacrifice of your son. Oh, you imputed that righteousness upon us, Lord. It is a legal deposit into our account. We are not walking on our own track record. It is a track record of your son that we stand on right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us walk in that victory this week, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Anybody feel it? We're going to a new level, amen? We're going to a new level. Amen. Praise God. All right, let's take a short break, and please don't go anywhere. We want to support those that are going to be baptized. It's a great time uh, in the Lord, give us about five, ten minutes, and then we'll draw these curtains and we'll continue. Cast away, trying to make it back home.